Without further ado, we will introduce our moderator for today, Eloisa Acha. She is the Director for Research Relations at the Cockrell School of Engineering at UT Austin. Take it away, Eloisa. Thank you, Javier. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last edition for 2020 of Text Talks. Today, we will be talking about additive manufacturing or 3D printing with Dr. C. Said. Now, if this is the first time that you join us, the format is the following. First, Caroline will share a presentation on the topic. During this time, feel free to use the chat box to type your questions. During the last 20, 25 minutes, I will moderate a Q&A section and then we'll wrap up at the end of the hour. So now let me introduce our expert for today's talk. Caroline Superset is the J. Mike Walker Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. She received a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Georgia Tech in 2004, an MA BA in Philosophy, Politics and Economics from Oxford University in 1998 as a Rhodes Scholar, and a BS in Mechanical Engineering from West Virginia University in 1996. She is currently the director of the Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation and a member of the UT System Academy of Distinguished Teachers. Dr. Seeprasad has earned many awards for her research and teaching, including the University of Texas Regents Award for Outstanding Teaching. This is the highest teaching award for faculty in the University of Texas system. Her research interests include design for additive manufacturing, simulation-based design of materials and structures, and process innovation in additive manufacturing. She is a co-organizer of the annual Solid Freeform Fabrication Symposium and a member of the ASME Design Engineering Division Executive Committee. She is the author of more than 125 peer-reviewed conference and journal publications, including Best Paper Awards from ASME and ASEE. She teaches courses on engineering design and additive manufacturing. Welcome, Caroline, and I hand over the microphone to you. All right, thank you very much, Eloisa, for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today, and hello to everyone in the audience. Um, today, I'll be talking about um, a passion of mine, which is additive manufacturing and design. In particular, I'm gonna try to achieve two goals today. One thing I'd like to do is introduce you to a new additive manufacturing research center that's being established at, here at UT Austin. And the other thing I'd like you to do, to do is to dive a little bit more deeply into some of the research that we're doing both as part of the center um, and also that I'm personally engaged in with my graduate students and collaborators. <clears throat> so our mission really as part of our, our research center, our new additive manufacturing research center is to enable widespread adoption of AM. All right, by advancing um, additive manufacturing processes and fostering innovation, both in new processes as well as in design practices. We're very interested in building partnerships, both within the university and external to the university. Um, and we can look at a number of different TRL levels or different ways of approaching additive manufacturing and design. So the first thing we're very interested in doing is exploring the use of industrial quality additive manufacturing or AM processes to fabricate parts. Um, sometimes that can be a very challenging task and we have a lot of expertise in design for additive manufacturing um, to approach really complex problems. And I'll talk about a few of those examples later today. We're also very interested in pushing the boundaries of existing processes. Um, we're very interested in doing materials development and looking at new levels of quality control and predictability. And finally, I'm going to highlight um, quite a few new additive manufacturing processes that are under development by some of the faculty as our, in our center. And so if current processes can't achieve the goals that we seek, then we're very eager to innovate, innovate new ones. So this is just um, a highlight of some of the expertise of some of the founding members of our center. Um, so we have um, interlocking or overlapping expertise in materials, in design, and also in machine uh, design and process development as well with several of the faculty members who are part of our center. And we believe that this cross-domain expertise really is a strength of our center. Um, and we have a number of research test beds that we're developing to push the limits of additive um, at all TRL levels, and I'll show that in a second. But let me just pause as well to note that these are the founding members of the center, and we're always eager 
um, to, to engage additional faculty member across the university who might like to be um, affiliates or uh, members of our center. Um, and we'll be reaching out to many of you over the next few months as the center gets underway. So for those of you who may have been on campus before in our mechanical engineering building, um, we call it ETC. Um, on the ground floor, this is a schematic of that ground floor. You see the loading dock over on the right. You can see the machine shop here and the elevators back here. Um, so our new center is um, taking over quite a bit of the ground floor of ETC. So you'll see here we've got a polymer powder bed fusion lab, um, SLS, polymer SLS here. We have a metal powder bed fusion lab here in red. Um, so we currently have an EOS N280 direct metal laser sintering machine operating in that room. We have metrology in the back and we also have a liquid polymer lab with a digital anatomy printer as well as a SLA 5000 stereolithography machine operating in these rooms as well. Um, and we're going to expand to incorporate some additional rooms in the near future, which will give us over 3000 square feet of space um, for the center. And here you can see just a few of the commercial machines that we already have available. Um, an EOS M280 for direct metal laser sintering. You can see its inaugural print there um, in the upper left. Um, we also have a liquid polymer lab where we have a digital anatomy printer that you can see running on the right. Um, that's capable of recreating human tissues like heart, bone tissue. Um, we have a long running interest in polymer powder bed fusion. It was invented in our department with Joe Beeman. And then we have a very wide range of metrology equipment and processes available um, as well. And so in addition to commercial equipment, we really pride ourselves in uh, many of the test beds that some of our additive manufacturing center members have developed as part of their research. And I've listed a few of them here, both in polymers, metals, and ceramics. So we've got three different categories here. On the right hand side, we have the commercial industrial machines and then um, from left to right, we're, we're focusing on TRL levels of development where TRL one would be basic research and TRL nine plus would be, you know, commercial industrial machines that have already been marketed and available in the marketplace. And so we have quite a few um, research test beds in both polymers, metals and ceramics. And let me highlight just a few of those as we go along. So here's a couple of examples of research test beds that we have currently in the ceramics area. On the left is additive manufacturing of concrete structures. So this is a collaboration with Mitch Pryor in robotics and several faculty in civil engineering. And together what we've done is we've created a robotic system that's capable of fabricating um, meter scale walls in concrete. We use mortar here and we have um, a mortar mixing station, a pump off to the side. And this is a six axis robotic arm um, that deposits that concrete into pre-specified patterns. Over on the right, we have selective laser flash sintering of ceramics. So this is a collaborative research project between Dr. Kovar and Dr. Beeman um, in mechanical engineering. In this particular case, um, what they're focusing on is fabricating ceramic parts. Ceramic parts are usually made using an indirect process um, whereby you use a laser to selectively melt a polymer to hold together the ceramic parts. Um, and then later the polymer is burned off um, and the parts are then sintered, but this is slow and it can be very difficult for large parts. Um, so instead what they're working on here is a novel new process that combines an electric field with a scanning laser. And the idea here is that you can lower the temperature and greatly increase the speed of direct laser sintering. Um, and then from that we can achieve green parts that we can later sinter fully in an oven. Here's a couple of examples of metal test beds that are under development. On the left, we have micro cold spray. This is also from Professor Kovar in mechanical engineering. Um, and in this particular case, um, this, this process is capable of depositing pattern thick films. Um, it basically uses a high velocity impact of submicron particles onto a substrate. The neat thing is that the substrate can be polymer, metal, ceramic. I've even seen them right onto Kleenex. Um, it's a room temperature process with near, near, near full density and conductivity of the materials that they deposit. Um, and so one of the interesting applications could be hybrid ceramic and metal devices. So circuitry, for example, on temperature sensitive substrates like polymers. On the right hand side, we have a microscale SLS or laser sintering system that's developed by uh, Dr. Cullinan in mechanical engineering and his collaborators. Uh, this process is really aimed at very, very small scale metal features. 
So if, for example, you'd like to apply additive manufacturing to micro or nano manufacturing applications, like for example, example wafer scale interconnects, it's really impossible to do that because most commercial machines have feature sizes that go as small as maybe 50 microns. It's usually larger than that. But you need much smaller feature sizes here. And so this process will actually give you five micron um, metallic features at high speeds. Um, they uh, deposit a liquid nanoparticle bed, and then they use a laser to scan that part of that um, bed selectively and fuse the particles together, and then they repeat that process layer by layer. Here are a couple of our innovative test beds in photopolymers. So on the left, this is work from Professor Zach Page in chemistry, um, and this is a high resolution visible light 3D printing. Um, he uses liquid resins that polymerize rapidly. Um, on exposure to visible light. Um, so if you're familiar with stereolithography or other um, similar types of photosensitive additive manufacturing, typically they use ultraviolet wavelengths of light, but he uses visible light in this case. Um, and one of the characteristics is that it's a very low energy process, so it's very, very efficient. Um, the speed, the resolution, the uniformity though is competitive with ultraviolet um, methods. Um, and one of the really unique things about it is that with wavelength selective chemistry, um, this process enables graded parts. So you could have, for example, hard and soft joints. On the right, um, we have a large scale high viscosity stereolithography machine. And this is something that I'm involved in along with Dr. Rich Crawford and some of our graduate students in collaboration um, with Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, this particular uh, machine is aimed at printing very, very high viscosity um, resins um, in stereolithography and then being able to do this over a very large scale without damaging the fine features of parts. A couple of polymer powder bed fusion innovative processes that we have under development on the left hand side um, is, some, is something developed by Jared Allison as part of his PhD dissertation aimed at en enhancing the speed of selective laser sintering. So in this case, what we do is we deposit dopants that are electrically conductive into a polymer powder bed, and we selectively deposit those dopants, and then we apply um, an electromagnetic field, in this case, radio frequency, to the entire powder bed at once, and it heats only the areas that have been selectively doped. You can see a longhorn on the bottom left that Jared fabricated. On the right, you can see um, one of our um, higher TRL level test beds. This was developed by uh, Joe Beeman and Scott Fish and their collaborators. And this is a completely open hardware, open software laser sintering machine. Um, it's capable of higher temperatures than most polymer machines and is fully instrumented. Here you can see an infrared camera, a visible camera. They've also um, outfitted it with OCT as well. And there's an image on the bottom there of an OCT scan of the powder bed, and you can start to see under the surface. Uh, they use this type of information to provide feedback control, intelligent feedback control to the process so that they can adjust it to get better parts with better geometric and mechanical accuracy. So I just wanna take a deeper dive now into one of our process innovations and give a little bit more detail and so today I'm going to dive a little bit further into reactive extrusion AM, um, also called REAM. And this is a, a fun project that I've been involved with, along with uh, Dr. Mayron Tarani, another professor in the department in our graduate students. On the left, you can see a basic schematic of the process. So it has a couple of reservoirs on the left with a metering system underneath. Um, and the metering system then moves through a, a series of pumps. Um, through what's called a mix manifold and then um, through a mixing nozzle to deposit resins onto a, a build platform. And in this case, um, if you're familiar with standard 3D printers, desktop 3D printers, extrusion based machines, typically you have um, filaments of thermoplastic material that melt and are then deposited. In this case, instead of using thermoplastics, we're using thermoset uh, materials. In this case, we're using a two part epoxy those two parts are stored in these two reservoirs and then they're mixed at the point of the mixed manifold, they're, they're combined at the outlet of the mixed manifold and then mixed in this passive mixing nozzle. And so then they cure very rapidly on the build platform and that allows us to build parts um, very, very quickly. It's ultra fast, which I'll show you in a second, and it's very energy efficient, so no external energy is required. And we can fabricate um, nearly isotropic parts. 
So here you can see on the bottom right, a longhorn that we printed. It's about 10 inches across um, and we printed it in two minutes. So let's take a look. Here's a video on the left of our thermoset, our reactive extrusion printer, printing that longhorn in real time. Um, and this build platform is about a foot across, so that gives you some sense of scale here. And just for kicks, on the right-hand side, we took the same printer and we set it up to print as a standard desktop thermoplastic printer. Um, so I thought I, you could compare how fast uh, the longhorn is printing on the left. Um, with how fast the uh, standard desktop thermoplastic printer is able to print um, a similarly sized Longhorn on the right. Um, so what prints in about two minutes in our reactive extrusion printer takes um, about five hours um, in the plastic printer on the right. And one of the things you'll notice from this video is the yellow nozzle is the mixing nozzle. So the two part epoxy is being mixed um, in that mixing nozzle passively as it passes through um, so that it's mixed by the time it's deposited. Um, then it rapidly cures, right? So there's no external energy required for curing these materials. You can see here, these are some infrared camera images of a part, a very simple um, rectangular part as it cures. And so here you can see one, two, three, four, five minutes. These are our um, time periods after um, initial deposition. On the left hand side here, you can see that the peak temperature is 90 degrees C because we're printing on a heated build platform, um, but the material itself is room temperature as it's deposited. And because um, the, photo, the polymerization, the polymerization of the epoxy is an exothermic process, you see the parts start to heat up as we move to the right. So after five minutes, um, we've got quite a few sections of the part that are above 100 degrees C. So this is a two-part epoxy. We're using an EPON 8111 resin with a curing agent, um, and that provides an exothermic reaction that cures really quite quickly. So the gel time on this is less than two minutes. And what that does is it helps um, solidify the part in time for the next layer to be laid. The rheology of the resin has to be engineered to retain its shape. So if we used a standard epoxy resin, um, as mixed, it would not hold its shape. Instead, it would spread out over the build platform. So we used additives like fume silica um, to enhance its viscosity. And one of the other things, again, I'll mention is rapid polymerization. Um, so that rapid polymerization provides better interlayer or across layer mechanical properties because we get some cross linking across layers and we get a rapid increase in strength for printability. So once a layer is deposited um, as it polymerizes quickly, its strength increases, and so it can support subsequent layers. All right, so here's a couple of the different systems that we've engineered. On the left-hand side, you can see our desktop system, with which is um, basically a desktop FDM printer. It's a Lulzbot TAS-6 in this case, that's been retrofitted with a metering system that you can see on the left. Um, flow rates um, up to around seven kilograms per hour. So this is about an order, at least an order of magnitude faster than almost any um, smaller scale FDM printer that's available. Um, it can build small parts up to about 25 centimeters or so, 10 to 12 inches and low viscosity polymers simply because of the, the pumping system. On the right, you see our Gen 2 system. This is a robotic system using a six degree of freedom or six axis, not six degree of freedom, but six axis, robotic arm that prints onto a heated build plate. We have reservoirs um, still um, to hold the, the multiple materials. And then we have progressive cavity pumps to pump the fluid. Still use a disposable mixing nozzle, um, which allows mixing of the materials. They don't come in contact until they reach the mixing nozzle. So we don't have any polymerization happening um, in the guidelines or in the mix manifold, only in the mixing nozzle, which is actually disposable. Um, so once things harden in that, we simply throw it away and replace it. The flow rate in our robotic system is really high. We can get up to about 75 kilograms per hour there. And so that's on the order of um, the very fastest um, systems out on the market. So for example, BAM, the big area additive manufacturing um, system that's been commercialized out of Oak Ridge National Labs has a, has a similar level of flow rate. We can do variable mixing ratios high viscosity polymers up to about 100 Pascal seconds. And we can do larger parts with this, smaller parts as well, centimeter scale, but also meter scale parts because of the robotic arm. 
We're engineering the resins for printability. So I think I mentioned that um, one of the things that's important is that layers of this resin are able to support subsequent layers. So first of all, the storage and loss modulus of these materials has to be low enough to be printable, but it has to increase rapidly so that it can support subsequent layers. And one of the things we can measure is the viscosity of the material as it exits the nozzle. And so here you can see some shear rate dependent viscosities of some of the materials that we're using. Um, our robotic system is capable of printing up to 100 Pascal seconds. The red on the bottom is pure resin or EPON 8111. So the viscosity there is so low that it doesn't hold its shape at all after it exits the nozzle. So we add um, silica as a thickening agent. And what we printed in the previous um, slide that I showed you is the green line here at three and a half percent silica. But with our robotic system, we can go up quite a bit larger to much larger fractions of silica or other additives like carbon fiber. One of the things we have investigated is the mechanical properties of these parts. Um, and that's incredibly important for anyone who's um, done research in additive manufacturing. And one of the things you may know if you're familiar with with many of these processes is that they tend to be anisotropic. And what we mean by that is that the properties of the materials tend to be worse in the Z direction or in the height direction across layers. So if we place uh, a part in tension and that, the, that tension crosses layers, uh, then that tends to be weaker than um, stretching the parts within the layers, what we call intralayer um, strength. Here you can see we built some walls, some vertical walls, and from that we machined tensile bars. You can see an array of them on the right. Um, the little markings there, those little black hash marks that are either vertical or horizontal indicate um, the direction of the layers in those parts. So we know whether we're stretching them parallel to the layers or across layers. You can also see that some of these parts have different colors and that's gonna turn out to be important um, because the darker colors indicate, indicate a greater degree of cure and that's gonna have some influence on the strength of these parts. So here we can see some of the mechanical properties from these parts. We were very pleased with what we saw. Um, so on the left-hand slide here, you see a stress strain plot. The black uh, dotted line is the published value of strength for this particular epoxy resin, which is 69 megapascal. And then the red and blue lines are um, results from um, strength testing of some of the tensile bars that you saw on the previous slide. Um, the blue lines are interlayers, so that is across layers where we expect parts to be weaker. And then the red lines are within the layers. One of the things you'll notice is that almost all of the parts meet or exceed the published value for this particular resin, which is really quite good. Another thing you'll notice is that um, the red parts, so the ones within the layer, appear to have a longer elongation, a greater elongation at break. And we'll dive into that just a little bit more. So on the right here, you can see um, these are um, box plots of the strength values for all of the specimens, intra and interlayer. And one of the things you'll notice here is that the means of those two sets are very similar, so there's no statistically significant difference between strength within the layer or across the layer. Um, so that means that um, we are, are, are not observing significant anisotropy in these parts. They're fairly isotropic. Um, but elongation at break, on the other hand, is not. And so I, um, you can see that visually from the plot um, on the left, but we've run the statistics as, as well. And there is a statistically significant difference in elongation at break. Um, the parts that are in tur layer or Z parts tend to be a little bit more brittle um, than the parts that are tested within the layer. That could be due to slight uh, lack of fusion across the layers. But we do see polymer cross-linking across the layers, which is what accounts for that uh, really nice strength across the layers as well as within. The other thing we're seeing um, is that the ultimate strength of the parts, you may have noticed some variability on the previous slide, and most of that variability actually is explained by the degree of curing of the parts. Um, so low degrees of curing, sort of white parts, yellow parts, orange parts, you can see that there's almost a perfect correlation between the degree of curing and the ultimate strength of those parts. And on the right here is just a DSC image um, of in brown is uncured resin. So each of these peaks indicates an exotherm 
Um, the polymerization of these resins is an exothermic reaction, so the exotherms basically document uh, the progress of the reaction. So the uncured resin has an additional exotherm because, of course, it hasn't been cured. And then the green, blue, and red um, plots are for um, lighter colored in terms in the red and darker colored in terms of the green plot here um, specimens. And you can see that the exotherms are very small for uh, the green line here, which is the fully cured parts. And so those are achieving about 98% degree of curing. So we're getting quite good curing. Um, as long as the process is really well controlled. So where do we go with this? Why is it so exciting to us? Well, we can build composites, ultra high strength composites that we're working on currently. We can functionally grade those things because we can mix on demand. We can mix lots of things on demand um, and also do smart and active structures as well. Because the flow rate is so high and we have a robotic system capable of doing this printing, we can also do large scale structures very high speed, we could do conformal repair of um, damaged concrete or other structures, could create um, frameworks as well for depositing concrete. Um, deposition is challenging though, it's not an easy process. The rheology is hard to get right, um, to be able to, to be printable, but still strong enough to support subsequent layers. It needs to cure quickly. Um, and then there are exothermic temperature rises associated with that that we have to deal with as well. And we have to make sure that the degree of cure is adequate. Um, for good strength. So that was a deep dive into a process innovation. I wanted to do a little bit, another deep dive into some design innovations as well. Um, and so many of you may be familiar with some of the really cool parts that um, additive manufacturing enables that we simply wouldn't have been able to print any other way. So I usually tend to, to cluster those into three different categories. One is uh, one of a kind fabrication. So these are just single one off parts that are very unique for one reason or another, perhaps for functionality. Um, so these are examples of some la selective laser centered gu electric guitar bodies. Um, and then here in the upper left is I've taken an image from um, Zach Page's um, visible light uh, lithography work. And in this case, one of the things that he can do with his process. Um, is to selectively uh, cure different po polymers to different levels. So you could have different levels of, um, of hardness or softness depending on um, region or location. So you could get really unique properties that way. Another category is personal customization. So you may be in, familiar with Invisalign braces. Um, you may or may not know that all of those Invisalign braces were fabricated using additive manufacturing, stereolithography as, as a matter of fact, so that they're custom fit to your particular mouth and the stage of your dental restoration. Um, here's another example of some work from um, Dr. Rich Crawford and Dr. Rick Neptune and, and their uh, students in our department looking at building customized prosthetics. Um, and not only can you customize it to an individual person's residual limb, um, but you can also customize the stiffness in particular locations as well. Um, on the bottom left hand side here, um, we've got functional complexity. So the ability to, to modify the architecture of a part um, in order to get interesting functionality. And here on the bottom left are some um, interesting negative stiffness honeycombs that I'm going to dive into just a little bit. So some of the challenges um, that we see in from the design perspective from additive manufacturing is, first of all, the design space is simply massive. Um, there are nearly unlimited degrees of freedom. Um, the process parameters at the feature scale, um, if we're using architected materials, the unit cell, and then even at the part level, just so many degrees of freedom that it can be difficult to manage all of those. The other thing challenge we face from the design perspective is the inherent variability that we find in additive manufacturing processes. Learning to, to mitigate that and then learning to um, manage its effects on, on parts and products. So um, here, one of the things we have is uh, ne some negative stiffness honeycomb work that we've done in my research group. And this is in collaboration with Mike Haberman, um, Desi Kovar and some of our students. Um, and in this case, these are honeycombs that are fabricated using additive manufacturing um, that absorb energy elastically and then recover to their initial configuration. 
So if you compare those to conventional honeycombs, like you see on the top, um, they'll absorb energy as well, but that's through plastic buckling. And so there's a single compression lifespan. Ours can absorb energy and then return to their original configurations and then repeat the process over and over again. So let's take a look at the mechanical performance of some of these honeycombs and understand what's unique about them. So we call them negative stiffness honeycombs because as each layer starts to deform, it snaps through to a different buckled state. And when it does that, you see what's typically a positive um, slope on a force displacement curve all of a sudden become a negative slope. Um, and you can see that happening right here. And we've got four rows of beams, so you see four negative stiffness regions. One of the cool things about this, though, is as it absorbs energy, it does that at a reasonably constant force threshold. And we can engineer that force threshold so that we can mitigate impacts at a, at a prescribed acceleration or force threshold level. Here you can see two of our honeycombs. Well, one honeycomb here, you can see its architecture. Um, and so we've dropped a heavy mass on top of this honeycomb when it's uncompressed and when it's compressed. And here you can see the difference in acceleration or G's, G levels experienced by that mass as it lands on the compressed honeycomb in blue and the uncompressed honeycomb in red. So it's taken what would have been a 40 G impact and reduced it by an order of magnitude. And so this is indicative of many of the things that we see from this particular honeycomb. So one application that could be extremely useful for that we've looked in, started looking into is um, helmet applications and personal protection applications. So this is an example of what we call a conformal honeycomb. So it's kind of made so that you can tile it inside a helmet or other um, device. We've um, done some drop testing, some impact testing here. You can see the rig that we have out at our applied research labs and our instrumented head form. So we use an existing sporting helmet. We include our elements. We can compare it to foam that might have typically been in that place instead. And then we can compare the accelerations that, that's felt at the base or crux of this instrumented head form. And here you can see this is um, dropping um, the head form from a height of about 12 inches. So it's quite heavy, the head form and all the mechanics that goes with it. Um, and then the foam here you can see as giving the head form about 12 Gs of acceleration, whereas the negative stiffness elements down around four. So our elements tend to do really quite well for these larger impacts, um, sort of hitting another player or falling from down and hitting your, maybe hitting your, the back of your head onto a football field. These are things that we can mitigate quite well with our elements. We've also done some work to look at isolating mechanical systems, and this is work with Sandia National Lab. Um, you can see this is a very, very large mechanical impulse. So this is a 12,000 G um, impulse that this particular element is experiencing on a um, impact testing rig. And that would be the equivalent of a basically dropping something out of an aircraft and allowing it to hit the ground. And so in blue, you can see what the carriage, which is it's what the element is riding on is experiencing that 12,000 G's. And then in red, you can see what you would feel if you were riding on top of our element as opposed to just on the carriage. And you can see, uh, again, an order of magnitude reduction in acceleration. We can also apply these somewhat conformally. Here you can see them sort of wrapping around a base um, and, um, si and similarly applying an impact load um, and cutting it down again by an order of magnitude. We can also take these elements and we can reduce them in size. Um, so here you can see our, our sort of trademark um, curved beams, but now they're arranged around something we call an inclusion. So this is an extremely small um, mechanism. It's about two millimeters across. So if you were holding it in your hand, it would be about the size of a grain of rice, so small that it would be tough to see these beams. Um, this is a collaboration be between um, Mike Haberman and myself and our students and some fabricators at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So we made these inclusions, these tiny inclusions, and then we placed them inside a polymer matrix, which you can see here. There are only four of them um, inside this polyurethane matrix. And then what we've done is we've placed them on a shaker table. Um, so the shaker table you can see at the bottom here, um, the shaker table starts to shake, and then we can see, um, we can compare the acceleration at the shaker table to that at the top of the assembly. We also have a threaded rod moving through the center of the assembly, and so as we tighten that threaded rod, we pre-compress these beams, 
And so we get to the point where they're almost ready to snap through, but not quite. Um, and that's a point where then as we start to vibrate the structure, they snap through it back and forth very violently, um, as violently as you can when you're only two millimeters um, large. Um, and then they provide additional, they basically strain the surrounding matrix um, and provide energy dissipation. So in this plot down here in the bottom, you can see um, basically frequency on this axis. And you can see that there is a resonant frequency for this structure, um, this ridge that you see here. And you can also see that at a particular level of pre-strain, when we activate these elements, they're almost ready to snap through. We basically eliminate that resonance peak. Um, and we get broadband damping from the structure. And so I'm very happy to say that this, well, this is one of the first um, demonstrations of a mechanically tunable broadband damping um, metamaterial. But I'm really pleased to say that we got these results the very, very first time we tested it. Um, but that wasn't an accident. So we actually did a lot of design work, sophisticated design work behind the scenes to get that right the first time. So one of the things we do is we model um, this system as a multi-scale system. Um, and so we have a micro to meso model here that basically um, determines the effective properties, mechanical properties of these inclusions. Then we have what we call a meso to macro model, which is a homogenization based model developed by uh, Mike Haberman and um, his students to treat the matrix and the inclusions as a composite. And from that, we can determine the properties of the metamaterial. But what we really want to do is to be able to say we want, instead of moving from left to right, which is a very analytical mindset, we want to move from right to left. We want a design mindset that says we want these properties. What does the geometry look like? So what we do is we take these models and we sample. And so each of these little polka dots here is meant to kind of abstractly represent the fact that we're sampling. We're trying different geometries, seeing what properties they give us, combining those properties of the inclusion with matrix design variables, and then seeing what kind of metamaterial properties we want. We're targeting certain properties. We want high stiffness, high loss. And so then we classify those as high performance. And we can trace those back um, to the different design variables that gave us that performance. One of the things we're doing is we're using machine learning classifiers um, to be able to map those regions so that we can generalize about where good designs lie versus poor designs. So these classifiers are borrowed from machine learning. Um, basically, if you have a set of designs that are, let's say, high performance designs, uh, then you can center uh, kernel den density estimate. You can center Gaussian kernels on each of those points and then aggregate them into a kernel density estimate. And so you can see here a kernel density estimate for high performing class in, in green or blue. And then in red, you can see the low performing class. We apply Bayes rule to that to establish a posterior probability that basically tells us for any point in space, what's the probability that it's a high performance point versus a low performance point. And then we can use that to distinguish between different regions of the design space to identify good regions. So here's what it looks like when we apply it uh, to um, our design space. Um, what we can do is we can highlight certain areas of the space as we did in blue here in the upper right. We can map that back to good properties of our inclusion. So these are effective stiffness properties. And then we can map that back to good design variables. So these are essentially different geometric parameters that define the design of the inclusion. We can tighten that space and see the, the blue design spaces tighten up even more. You'll see a linear relationship here, which seems like it might indicate that our simulations are not performing quite right. But on the contrary, uh, this actually matches some theoretical predictions that suggested that this type of performance should be seen from uh, materials with constant bulk stiffness, bulk modulus, which is exactly what you're seeing here. So we make these inclusions using microstereolithography, which is a process that was developed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, where they can build really small features on the order of 50 microns, and they can build it over a large area of several inches. Um, so we take, um, look at our design space here, um, and we have a mapping of it, um, and we pick, we can pick good designs to fabricate. The difficulty is that when we do fabricate them, um, 
we have some imperfections. And so here you can kind of see that the shape of the beams, the size of the beams may not be exactly what we wanted. And so we're very in tune with that, knowing that we may not get good performance. So what we've done to combat that is we take our design space mapping. So this green cloud that you see here, all of the is the design region that indicates all of the high performing design points in terms of the thickness of the beams, the apex height of them, the modulus as well. Using the Livermore process, we're able to um, fabricate a batch of these inclusions. Um, we can test them for um, modulus. We can also um, characterize their, their geometric um, resolution and accuracy. And then from that, we get distributions of geometric accuracy and material properties. We can use our original classifier um, combined with the Monte Carlo sampling of those distributions to narrow our, our region, our design region of interest to only the design points that are not only high performance as predicted by our simulations, but are also likely to be high performance even given the variability that we observe in geometry and material properties. And so that's how we got these excellent material properties the first time around. So I also wanted to talk a little bit more. I'll give you one more example on handling variability and additive manufacturing processes. Um, and so in this case, we are fabricating lattice structures. Um, here you can see um, a a lattice structure that's composed of what we call octet truss lattices. They're arranged in a seven by seven by seven unit cell arrangement. Each one of these unit cells is about five, centi five millimeters wide and each strut is about 0.75 millimeters. We fabricated them using direct metal laser sintering using the same type of machine that we have in our AM center. Um, and then we tested them. So we had batches of them in one build in the blue and another build in the pink and red. And we've tested them to full densification. One of the things you'll notice is that thankfully there's reasonable amount of consistency within each build. There's differences across the build, which I'll talk about, but neither of them are nearly as strong as we predicted they would be. So let's talk a little bit about that. So if we look at the experimental mean in black versus our finite element predictions, they're off by as much as 60% and the experimental results are much less stiff in this case than we expected them to be. In many cases in additive manufacturing, um, the as-designed dimensions are not the same as the as-built dimensions. So if we correct for that, which we did here, our errors get a little bit better, but they're still 30 to 40%, and that's not particularly good. So what could be causing that? Well, there are a number of reasons. When we build these struts, um, they have quite a bit of variability. Sometimes you, they have a lot of surface roughness, they're not especially straight, um, and they could also have some porosity that affects their performance. So we decided to investigate that a little bit more closely. One of the things we did is we created small tensile bars with the gauge length replaced by small sets of struts. And so that allowed us to build a whole bunch of struts at different orientations, flat or vertically, and with different sizes of struts and to see what effective stiffness or mo modulus, tensile modulus we got from the struts and whether that differed from what we got from the bulk material. We worked with Sandia National Labs to do this. This is a picture of their high throughput testing system that uses a load frame and a DIC system to rapidly test all of these samples. Some of the results you'll see here on the right where um, the orange is the solid specimens, and then the blue um, are the strut specimens. And one of the things we found is that although we expected a 195 gigapascal elastic modulus, what we found was quite a bit lower and that the horizontal struts were much worse than the vertical ones. So when we CT scanned some of our specimens, it became clear why that was. So you can see that with these horizontal struts, it's very difficult for this metals machine to build those struts. So you see a lot of surface roughness. You see non-uniform cross sections as well. Um, and then with the vertical bars, you see much less of it. You also see that it gets a little bit better as the bars get larger. So when we incorporated that information into our finite element analysis models of our lattice structures, all of a sudden our errors went down to less than 5%. So we really need to know what's going on with these struts and take that into account to get an accurate prediction of the performance of these, of these specimens. 
So what we've done is we've taken that information and input it into um, a design process. Um, so here we've got um, an example ISO truss unit cell for a lattice structure. You'll see it has vertical, horizontal, and diagonal struts. So what we do is we model the properties of those struts based on what we've seen in our experiments. And so from that, using um, what we call a geometric projection method for doing the analysis in Abacus finite element, um, then we get all the properties of these unit cells as a function of the particular diameters of the struts and the orientation of the cell. We use that information to um, train uh, a neural network surrogate model that can take as input the diameters of the different struts and produce as output the elements of the constitutive tensor that basically governs the mechanical stiffness of these unit cells. Then we take this neural network model and we input it into a topology optimization um, routine where we can then take a domain, an arbitrary domain with loading, like in the case of, of this example, and then we can convert that into a lattice structure. And we can look at that and we can um, assume that these unit cells are process agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether the struts are horizontal or vertical or how they're oriented, or we can take that information into account. So here's some results. Um, if <clears throat> here's an example, this is called an MBB, MBB problem. It's a really standard sort of bridge type of problem in topology optimization. Here's an example of an agnostic um, properties and the results from that. And here's an example of large direction dependence and the results from that. And one of the things you'll notice is that by when that direction dependence is taken into account, it takes some of the load off of the horizontal struts that you can barely see up here and distributes it more to vertical and diagonal struts and um, also distributes that load a little bit more throughout the structure. And so these are types of things that we see um, and we get a much better performing structure that performs much more closely to our predictions than we would if we hadn't taken those things into account. So just to kind of sum up, um, I want to tie it a little bit back to the Additive Manufacturing Center. Um, and we're very excited um, to launch the center um, formally in the spring. Um, we think we're poised for innovation on a number of fronts. In terms of fabrication, we have cutting edge test beds in polymers, ceramics, and metals, both commercial as well as research systems. Um, and we're excited um, to test those on um, more, more real world example problems. Um, we are poised to conduct concurrent part in process design and intelligent control, hybrid AM, new materials development. Um, and then from the design perspective, all these fabrication processes really drive um, what we'd like to be able to do from, from the design perspective, uh, which is to look at, for example, the frontiers of performance, um, functionally graded materials, ultra high strength polymers, which were um, poised to investigate um, process aware parts and architected materials. And then we also have work on using machine learning to accelerate the design process. All right, so I'll just leave it here um, and uh, leave this um, slide up as we transfer into questions. Um, so if any of you are wondering how we can you can engage with our new Additive Manufacturing Center, we will have a virtual launch in the spring semester and we'll send out notifications through similar channels as this text talk to make sure you're aware of it. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you so Thank much, you so Caroline. Much, Caroline. Um, we do have a lot of questions around the uh, center. You have answered some of them on the last slide, um, but I know that we've seen excitement on uh, from both the graduate and some of the undergrad uh, students as well. Uh, let's let's answer a couple of the questions that are related to um, the REAM machine, the reactive uh, extrusion. So sure. there were a couple of questions uh, that came in earlier. One interesting one is how do you prevent the nozzle from clogging or is that replaced each time? That's a great question and the answer is that it is replaced each time. Um, so those nozzles cost us about two dollars to replace. So it's a really inexpensive nozzle. It's the only thing we have to replace because it's the only place where um, the constituent materials come into contact. Um, so, and we also have a little bit of grace period. So the, the gel time on that material that I, we were fabricating there is a couple of minutes. So as long as we don't pause the process more than that, we have a little bit of grace, grace period to be able to stop and start the process as well. 
as we're building parts. But that's definitely one of the challenges with that process that you really can't stop for long periods of time without replacing the nozzle. And um, what are the precision limitations of depositing ep epoxy versus thermoplastics? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have been focusing in the videos that you saw, you probably noticed that we were focusing more on size and speed. So the resolution was not quite as good um, as it is for, um, say, a desktop thermoplastic. That's more a, a factor of the size of the nozzle that we're using and the speed with which we're printing. So if we switch to a much smaller nozzle and print much more slowly, um, then our accuracy and our resolution should be on the order of the thermoplastics because um, we do have quite good control over it. We haven't done a full study of that, so I can't throw a slide up there, unfortunately, and, and compare numbers to numbers because, like I said, we've been mostly focused on um, building larger parts quickly and then looking at the mechanical properties because we think once we get the mechanical properties um, in line and reliable, um, then you know we can move on uh, to looking at at um, to refining the resolution and the accuracy as well. So that's a great question, though. Now, if we go, uh, there were again, there's going to be a lot of questions, so we're not going to get through all of them. Um, for the questions that we don't get a chance to answer live, make sure to email um, Caroline. You have her email here. But let's uh, let's take a couple of questions from your the the honeycomb uh, example. So one of the questions that we had here on the chat is uh, if you have investigated applying uh, the vibration damping during rocket launches. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we actually have a project with the Army Research Lab right now to look at um, sort of ballistic types of applications. Um, I think the full details of that are, are probably classified, so I don't know them myself. <laughs> um, but uh, the basic idea that uh, I think I can convey um, is to be able to protect, for example, electronics upon launch, right, or upon impact, actually, either one, right, because there are very large, if you need, for example, to have a bunker buster, right, and to, to go through one layer and have a big impact and then um, have something else happen after you go through go through an initial impact or if you want you know some sensitive electronics to be able to survive you know a blast of launch so we are actually working on that it's a combination of the honeycombs the metal honeycombs that I talked about um, and the micro cold spray work that Dr. Kovar is doing so um, the idea there is to be able to write circuitry on top of a metal honeycomb and then use the honeycomb to protect the circuitry. So that's that's kind of the idea there. So we are, it's a great question. It's almost like you knew what we were working on. So yeah, great question. And um, also related uh, to, to, to this application, can you discuss any research regarding optimizing build orientation of additive manufacturing parts in order to maximize mechanical properties for a particular application? Right, so uh, I guess the question is um, optimizing build orientation to maximize mechanical properties. I think there's just a number of research groups investigating similar things. Um, so there, there are a couple of different ways you can approach that, I think. One is I would call it a push and the other I would call it a, a pull, right? So um, from the push perspective, it is to improve the processing parameters and to get better control of the process so that you get better mechanical properties. And then from the pull perspective, it's the design side saying we need better mechanical properties. But even if we don't get them, how can we design around that? Um, I think the lattice work that I presented was one example of that. We're certainly not the only group doing that, um, but basically thinking about how you could change the orientation of the lattice structure or even the design of the unit cells that make up your lattice structure to better avoid weak orientations, right? And to better take advantage of stronger orientations. And so there's a number of research groups looking into not only strength, but also, you know, if you take an entire part and you start to rotate it, then you have trade-offs in terms of build time, build costs, the amount of material, the support structures that are required. And so there are all of those trade-offs associated with it where you might want to take that bridge and instead of building it horizontally, build it vertically, um, because then, you know, you, your, your strongest material direction maybe aligns better with um, the load paths 
but then all of a sudden your build becomes much longer and more expensive. So there are a lot of trade-offs associated with that. Great. Well, Caroline, it's time for us to wrap up and uh, we do want to thank you and we want to thank our live audience for their active participation. As I said, there were a lot of questions, so I'm sure uh, some of them um, we can answer um, uh, privately and then if reach out to Caroline and, uh, through her through her email. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Conavis and uh, to close our event and happy Friday to everyone. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Canavis Smith and I want to formally thank each of you for joining today's webinar. We hope the conversation was valuable. Next, we wanted to highlight a few of our professional development short courses and future webinars. Good leadership is always needed in tackling some of the world's biggest challenges. We at Texas Engineering Executive Education will be providing an engineering exam refresher course, and this course is meant to assist engineering students near graduation and working professionals in prepping for the fundamentals of engineering exam. Successfully passing this exam is the first step an engineer must take on the path to registering as a professional engineer in the future. Also, Texas Engineering will be hosted in our annual forensics conference. This annual conference brings together the best of academic and industry for an exciting exchange on forensics engineering. By using real world case studies such as hurricanes, structural failures, and foundation issues, the conference focuses on lessons learned across a variety of topics. Please be sure to visit our website to learn more about these upcoming events. Next, we wanted to quickly highlight the upcoming energy related courses with pipeline technology and measurement classes. If you or your organization need additional training in this area, please contact our PTEX department today. Next, we also wanted to thank the three units of the Cockrell School of Engineering that helped put this wonderful program together. First is our research relations team. This team partners with industry to solve some of the world's biggest problems in energy, water, transportation, additive manufacturing, and many more. The Office of Research Relations works to facilitate and derive high value from research collaborations between companies and UT's researchers. If your company would like to partner with the university to explore additional research opportunities such as additive manufacturing, please email the Research Relations Office to initiate a discovery discussion. Next is our Texas Engineering Executive Education, who works to reskill and upskill companies' current workforce, either through our master's degree program, graduate certificates, or short courses. So if you have a need around STEM education or training, make sure to contact our department to learn more. And last but not least is our PTEX department, the Petroleum Extension of Texas. This department has been around for over 75 years, serving the oil and gas professionals either through e-learning, publications, and online and in-person training. So we have the training you need for the oil and gas. All three units are here to serve you and your company through education, training, and research. So feel free to contact, contact us at any time, and we would love to collaborate on helping you reach your company's full potential. If you would like to provide feedback on today's webinar or suggestions for future topics that may interest you, please include them in our survey following this presentation. Once again, we would like to thank each of you for joining us today. This is our last text talks for the year, so we greatly appreciate you joining us for this series. We will return at the beginning of next year with exciting guests, topics, and program for you to enjoy. We hope you have a great weekend and hook them horns. <laughs>